So I'm going to give an attempt to uh, be optimistic here. Um, when I, uh, so I write a lot of software, but the truth is I'm actually a software hater. Most of what I do all day at work is complain about software, both our own software and other people's software. And just now I was checking my phone, and uh, it, Google now is telling me it's 10 minutes to get to Paris with a two minute delay. So pretty much I just file bugs all day because everything's broken and I'm just kind of used to it. But I'm also a software lover. Um, so I met Sylvain in San Francisco, and he said I could give a talk. And I said, what topic, or was this the conference? He's like, oh, whatever you want. And I was in a pessimistic mood that day, so I thought I'd give a talk about how software is terrible, and the cloud requires software, so therefore the cloud is terrible. <laughs> um, but that's kind of a depressing talk, and no one wants to hear that. Um, a friend of mine, Evan, has a game he loves to play called the Three Things Game. And the rules of the game are if anyone's being grumpy, somebody else can start the game and point at anyone else. And you know, have, you're at a table at lunch or something, and he says three things, and he points to someone. And the rule is that person has to think of three positive things. And they can't be like double negatives, like I'm glad I don't have to go to work on Saturday, or I'm glad I no longer have to use that idiot's code anymore. It actually has to be three positive things. And you're allowed to pass if you can't think of something. But if anyone passes, then everyone else has to pass. So it goes back around in a circle to the person who couldn't think of anything. So I've actually seen people cry trying to play this game because they couldn't think of three positive things. Um, I was getting to the point recently where I was not quite crying, but I was getting very close. So the solution, vacation. I just got back from Mexico and then came here. Um, vacation does wonders to change your mood on everything. So some pretty things, I took some pictures. I did bring a camera. The camera software was OK. That's the only software I really touched. <laughs> um, so throughout the trip, I've started to think, OK, maybe software is only just mostly terrible. In a couple more days, I'm thinking, OK, software is just often terrible. It's, you know, whatever. There's some good stuff. And then I'm thinking, OK, maybe, maybe it's just that the software I notice is terrible, because all the software that works, you just you know, you take it for granted. Um, Couple more days, I forgot about software. <laughs> Swimming and whatever. Um, towards the end of the trip, as I'm leaving in the airport, I realized there's actually software that I'm excited about. So, let's give a new talk. How about software I'm currently excited about? Um, and the software might be terrible that I'm excited about, but at least it's terribly exciting. Um, and also, this is very subjective. Uh, everyone is excited about different things. I don't follow graphics cards or games or uh, jQuery or lots of things, so maybe you're excited about different things. So if this bores you, well, whatever, go on vacation or something. Um, I'm excited about doing a startup again someday, whatever, hypothetical. Um, I came from a startup that I started on accident, which was LiveJournal, and it was about a dozen or two of me and my friends and my family, and uh, then I sold it to a startup in San Francisco. And then all my friends were working at Google, and after a couple years of doing the startup thing, I would walk up to my friends over at Google, and they would all get quiet. I'd be like, oh, shit, what are they talking about? Why are, why are they being quiet? And so they had all these secrets. So I decided that I would go to Google for six months, steal all their secrets, and then leave. And <laughs> it's been about six years now, and I haven't escaped. So um, I still dream about, hey, maybe one day I'll do a startup. But you know, me and my friends are all at at companies now where we're you know, doing fun things, working with smart people, and working on fun problems. So, um, but I still think about it. But I'm making a list of my dependencies. Um, if I were to do a startup again, I think I would need fast, cheap, reliable VMs. And I'll talk about all these four and what I'm excited about in that space. I think I would need some good machine cluster management system. Um, need a good programming language, something that is efficient and expressive and readable and safe and fun. And this is the only real thing that I, uh, I learned from Google. You need a good lock server. Um, and a bonus for a startup is maybe you know, making money and stuff like that. But OK, so VMs. I never want to manage VMs or no, never want to manage physical machines again. I did that once. I had maybe 250 machines, and I lived in the data center for a while, and blah, blah, blah. Now there's all these you know, kids these days have you know, EC2 and uh, Google and Rackspace and HP Cloud. There's all this competition. Prices keep going down. So I'm excited about that, that at least you know, when I escape, there will be VMs available to me. That's a boring one. Everyone takes that one for granted. Um, I also want some good machine or cluster management system. I, uh, back when I was doing LiveJournal, we still like, kind of manually configured machines and SSH'd into them. 
And you know, now there's like better things to manage a whole group of machines, but you still kind of think of like that machine does that thing or that instance does that thing. I don't really ever want to think in terms of instances or VMs. I want to think in terms of services and services or tasks or jobs have dependencies and they take up so much resources. I just kind of want to describe it, hit a button, and have it all kind of magically work. So I'm really excited about Docker. Docker is pretty cool. Um, if you haven't seen the demo online, the video uh, where Solomon goes through and like actually shows it, uh, go watch that. It's pretty awesome. So I, I'm excited to watch that mature. Um, Juju is another cool project that lets you describe a service and then uh, kind of wire them up and hit go and it brings up things on OpenStack you know, or EC2 or whatever and uh, runs your stuff for you. I also want a good programming language. Um, I've kind of found that there are basically two classes as a total generalization. There are basically two classes of programming languages. There are the ones that are fast but a pain in the ass. Things like C, whatever, and Java, Objective-C. And then there's your favorite Python, Ruby, PHP script, or whatever, which is, to me is all the same language. They're all, they're all slow. They can do one thing at a time. They explode at runtime. You write more documentation about your types and unit tests for your types rather than just typing the types. Um, and you know you have to write event based. If you're writing a server, it has to be event based because you don't have threads. Or if you have threads, you think you have threads, but you don't. It's totally crap inefficient threads. Um, but both models for writing servers in either like the left camp or the right camp or whatever, they both suck because thread per connection is painful and wastes lots of memory. Uh, event based servers are impossible to read. Your code is jumping all over the place. I've written lots of types of servers and. For a while, I was like, oh, event-based servers are great, and everyone likes Node, and you know, their, their callbacks, and their spaghetti, and their futures, and their promises, and all this stuff. But it's, it, it takes a really simple action of like, just I want to copy some bytes from this guy to this guy, and now you have a whole state machine that you have to think about when really it's one line of code. You just want to move this from here to here. So I don't know. I, I, I hate all these languages. I've had to use them a lot. When I went to Google, they were like, OK, you're writing everything in C++ and Java and Python now. And I was just like, ugh. Um, but then Go comes around, and at first I dismissed it because I was like, oh, yes, whatever, another language. Um, but I started working on it, and it's pretty awesome. Um, the thing I like about it is that it's both high level and fun when you want it to be, and it's low level and gives you control of the machine and memory when you have to. So it's not like um, I used to write lots of like Perl, and sometimes Perl would be slow, like all scripting languages are. And so I'd write some part in C. But there's a cost to be calling from Perl to C or C to Perl. So you'd have to kind of like stay in one world at a time for a while. And the decision about when you did that and like writing the glue code that connects the C to the Perl was ugly. So I like that in Go I can write in one language all the time and be high level and I have like, you know, I have closures and I have, you know, I can have callbacks or function types and I have like, you know, lots of data structures and all this stuff, but I don't actually have to, uh, and if I want to write something low level and say, this is how things are laid out in memory, this is how it allocates and whatever, then I can in that one thing. Or I could write the, all the code first high level, then profile it later and fix one part. And I don't have to worry about all this blue code of you know, trying to attach C later. So think of it as like a good C, or think of it as like a fast scripting language, but it's kind of both. And everyone is, you know, freaks out, oh, it's a compiled language, I don't want to deal with make files, I don't want to do this, blah, blah, blah. But it's often faster to say go run in your program than like Python takes to start up. Because when you start up Python, you know, looks at all the stuff on the file system, looks for all these PYC files. It's kind of hilarious if you go to strace Python sometimes, just how many things it tries to do. Um, go is also incredibly easy to deploy. You just, you have a file, and you just copy it. So there's no like, you know, don't have to deal with virtual env or making sure your dependencies are the right versions or like no JVM or JVM flags. You just have a static binary. Um, by default, it doesn't even use libc, so there, the system libraries don't even matter. You can have one process on the machine. It could be your init and run everything. Um, the cool thing in Go is that blocking is fine. You don't have this, this like dual API hell, like SSL, open SSL or something, where you have the, the blocking API, and then you have the non-blocking API. And like some parts of the API don't exist in the other one. Just, there's just one API, and the model is you always block, and you don't have to deal with callbacks. And the way that works is because Go has this concept of a Go routine, which is like a ridiculously lightweight thread that deals with all the details of being efficient behind the scenes. So if you need to uh, do a system call, then you get a real thread. If you need to like block on the network, then you'll use ePoll or KQ or you know, completion ports or whatever behind the scenes. Um, but, or if you need to sleep or wait on a mutex or you know, send from a channel, anything that might block, 
Go does the right thing behind the scenes in the runtime, and the runtime is you know, not a separate thing like the JVM that's actually compiled into your binary. And um, that means when you use somebody's API, you don't have to like, when, I, when you write something, we'll say like twisted or something, and you decide to like use somebody else's Python library, you're like, you just have to hope that that Python library was designed to be dropped into an event-based world, and you just hope it doesn't block, because then it will stall your event loop. In Go, you don't have to worry about that. You just, you just always block. And Go has things built into the language to say, I want to wait for these two things to happen, or these you know, dozen things to happen, and it all schedules it. So it's really nice. Your code reads top down, and you can actually understand the algorithm um, of your program. Um, I like to call Go a get shit done language. It's not like academically pure, you know, like a wonderful type system, and you know, no one's going to publish research papers about like how it advanced the state of computer science. It's a it's a pragmatic language for actually like, quickly writing code. Um, it's not like Java or one of these languages where the first thing you do when you fire up your editor is think, what should my type hierarchy be like? What inherits from what? What you just you just start writing code and the types kind of fall out naturally. It's really easy to mutate things over time. There's no inheritance. It's all about composition. It's, it's just a really fast way to write code. And it's, it warps your mind a little bit, but not a ton. It's not like I'm asking you all to go learn Haskell or something. It's, it's a little weird, but not that weird. So it looks like a normal language that you probably all use. It has curly braces and whatever. Um, great standard library, great community. Um, the tools integrate with all the, the popular version control systems or your own. So you can say things like, you know, go get github.com, and behind the scenes, it'll clone it into the right place and build it. Um, and then in your code, you know, whatever, you can do that. So yeah, there's a great community. Um, anyway, so I think I'm excited about Go. Um, if I did a future company, it would all be in Go. This is what I consider Google's kind of least appreciated secret sauce. Um, Google put out a paper about Chubby, which is our Paxos-based lock server. Um, Historically, there hasn't been anything good in the open source world, at least, um, or especially before I went to Google, uh, LiveJournal had its own lock server, and our lock server was kind of terrible. Uh, I never advertised it because I knew it was terrible. And we didn't use it for kind of anything too important because we knew we couldn't trust it and it didn't have any guarantees. Um, for instance, we never used it for master election. So we would have a whole bunch of uh, shards of user data or user clusters that each one of them was master slave and users were assigned to a different shard. But when one of those masters failed, so now we had like you know 14 single points of failure. You know we would get paged, and we would have to like kind of manually like check the MySQL replication, bin log, and make sure things were cool. But we never trusted like machines to automatically do the failover because we couldn't really trust the order of events, um, especially when we had a master and a bunch of slaves, and we wanted to like auto promote one of those slaves back up to the, B the master and make the slaves all, all the other slaves replicate from that new master. We, we always kind of had a human go look at the, the bin logs by hand to make sure that they're all at the same event position and all the stuff and you know, change the set MySQL master two commands and all that sort of stuff. Um, with a good lock server, you could actually have with uh, distributed consensus. So a whole bunch of machines can all kind of agree on the exact same order of events and know who did what and who, who's at what spot. So if a server does come up, it could you know, replay to the points it's at and all this. Um, there's basically no interesting system at Google that is not built on Paxos or Chubby. Um, so I want to see good open source implementations of this. There is Heroku made Doozer, which was a Go implementation of Paxos. They never used it in production, as far as I know. Um, they got distracted or something and did something else, but they put it on GitHub, and a whole bunch of people forked it. There were like five forks for a while, and a bunch of those were in production. They all recently converged. They're all now at GitHub, HA, Doozer, and Doozer D for the client and the server. So I'm excited to see um, if that matures or people are trusting that and using it in production. I'm also excited about, um, there's a new paper that just came out called Raft. Um, it is a consensus protocol um, out of Stanford. It is equivalent to Paxos. It has all the same guarantees, all the same properties, um, but it's understandable. The whole point of Raft was to come up with a consensus protocol that was actually understandable and could be taught and could be implemented from the paper. Because in practice, a lot of people, when they go to implement Paxos, they, uh, they kind of fudge and they skip parts or they get confused and they don't implement it properly, which is you know, why Heroku probably doesn't use Doozer because they probably didn't trust their implementation and stuff. So I'm excited that there's also now an implementation of Raft called Go Raft. I haven't looked at it, but it came out like right after the paper because it's really easy to write servers in Go and Raft is really easy to implement, so um, either Doozer or Go Raft, whatever. Like, I'm happy that 
there's new work happening in lock servers. So, bonus. This is my, my fifth item. I'm excited about um, Bitcoin, mostly because it's, uh, it's wonderfully technically and dorky, and it's also decentralized, and I feel like we don't have enough decentralized systems and protocols. I kind of feel that SMTP and email is kind of dying, or it's not evolving. Spam is kind of getting out of control in email, and I feel like messaging has increasingly moved to walled garden proprietary company things. Likewise, I feel like XMPP seems to like not really be succeeding as much. Um, I wanted XMPP to succeed a lot. I wrote an XMPP server back in the day. Um, so when I do see a distributed or a decentralized system like Bitcoin come about, it's very exciting. Uh, one of the most cool things about it is it basically has the transaction payloads for uh, Bitcoin actually has uh, like a little bytecode uh, language in it. And it's, it's not Turing complete, it doesn't have loops, so it actually terminates and you're limited to like, like a, uh, 200 some instructions and it could be like 10K long. But there's this whole bytecode that describes um, how you manipulate the stack and how you can do conditionals and how you jump. And then at the end, if it evaluates to, you know, like there's true at the top of the stack, then that transaction is successful. So you can do all sorts of transactions like, um, uh, like everybody funds, you could say that uh, I give money to this guy over here if, you know, a number of other people, unspecified number of people, also get the fund up to, you know, 500 bitcoins or something like that. And only if everyone or 500 bitcoins come about, then the money goes all at once. So it's basically like Kickstarter can be implemented in the bitcoin protocol and there's no company involved. Um, there's all sorts of crazy crap. Um, you can you could also do stuff like party A pays party B, but only if party C vouches for it. But party C can't actually ever get the money. He could just like vote. So there, there's like so many cool things you could do with Bitcoin. So I've just been watching um, as that takes off lately. Um, and worst case, Bitcoin doesn't take off or something else like it takes off or Square and all these other companies that are kind of trying to shake up the payment space. Make it so when I actually do do a company, I don't have to deal with banks and merchant accounts and whatnot. So in summary, um, my hypothetical future looks like I would have lots of cheap VMs and I would use something like Docker or OpenStack and Juju. I'd write all my code in Go. I would have some good lock server that I could actually trust and so I don't have to get paged in the middle of the night when something fails. And um, maybe use Bitcoin and then some business model, something, something, and then I would make money, which is very much like the South Park uh, episode with the underpant gnomes that just steal underwear and then profit. So. Anyway, do you see why I'm not doing a startup? Um, but one day, maybe. But in the meantime, I do like to play on things. So I'm also excited about my side project, uh, Camly Store. I've been working on this uh, about three years. It is, like all my other projects, is a terrible name. It stands for Content Addressable Multi-Layer Index Storage, because I just needed a directory to start this thing. And it's almost as bad as MogileFS, which is an anagram for OMG files and Gearman, which is an anagram of manager, because the manager delegates work but doesn't do any work itself. Um, so Camly Store is, kind of think of it as a personal storage system. It, I want to be able to put all my crap in it, whether that's like photos or files or backups or anything I produce on the web, blog posts, likes, comments, things I read. Um, and I don't want to have to organize it. I just want to like throw it all in there. There's no conflicts. Everything's content addressable. And then I just go index it all later. Everything's indexed. Everything's searchable. And everything's private by default. Kind of like your Gmail. All your email is private by default. And if you want to share something, or if you want to forward something, you can. Um, and it's it runs on everything. It's replicated and safe. Um, all the storage is just blobs, immutable blobs. It's all content addressed. Um, so the Camly store is a spec of how all this crap works all the protocols, all the HTTP protocols, API, how the schema, how you actually represent data, and it comes with an implementation of the server. Um, there's command line tools, there's web interface, which kind of sucks, because I'm not good at JavaScript. Um, there's a fuse interface, so you can mount it, like you know, Dropbox or whatever, and you can like, see a file system. There's an API. It's written in Go, so it runs on everything. It runs on pretty much every operating system and every architecture. You can run it on a Raspberry Pi, or you can run it on EC2, or App Engine, or Roku. Um, and the cool thing is it abstracts over all sorts of storage. So anything that can sort keys and values, uh, you can put your crap on it. So Postgres or Dynamo or MySQL or the file system. Uh, 
And it's pretty much been the impetus for much of the Go standard library, because as I hack on this, I keep having to find new things that you know, I've been wanting. So it's a huge project, and I probably wouldn't have attempted it without Go. So this is what keeps me occupied. Um, but thanks for all the software, even the, the terrible stuff. Thank you, yep. Thank you. Thank you.